I would add. Yes, Mr. Summers. Yes, uh, if I could just say, I think there's been an evolution of, of growing trust. There's been a real issue of trust. Uh, we are still in a young relationship, 22, 23 years old. I've seen in the strategic relationship in defense, uh, getting over the Cold War hangover. And, and therefore, what I sense is happening in the clinical trial industry is a suspicion of multinational companies and therefore it's going to be a whole bunch of public education that we all need to be putting our shoulders to the wheel on. I, I, I would just add that um, we have seen some progress in some areas of cooperation. The um, recent report uh, uh, mandated, I believe, by the Supreme Court from uh, Professor Chowdhury on, uh, on recommendations uh, for the clinical trials process. It contained a lot of very thoughtful uh, uh, recommendations. We, we don't know the status of those recommendations or whether they'll be implemented. We endorse most of them, uh, or in large part. The Indian Society of Clinical Research, which is a uh, organization of res researchers in India, uh, is, is another very thoughtful organization that is making very solid recommendations on how the industry should proceed. But, uh, but at the moment, <coughs> we're pretty much at a standstill. All right, thank you for your comments. And this question is for uh, Ms. Dempsey and anybody else could, could feel free to, to add in as well. Um, the situation with India as, as a major economy is kind of unique to the United States. I know, for example, with the TTIP negotiations with Europe, we have a situation where uh, tariffs, especially on manufactured products, are very low or quite low, uh, where it's a real impediment for a lot of industries that are non-tariff barriers. And some, we have somewhat of the same situation with China, where, where tariffs are relatively low, uh, from what I understand, uh, there are a fair number of non-tariff barriers. But with India, we have a situation where there are apparently a large number of non-tariff barriers, but the tariffs are actually quite high. It can fluctuate as well. Could, could you maybe comment on where you see um, specific problems some of your industries, your member industries have with regard to tariffs in China, in particular with, with the fluctuation in tariff? I'm sorry, with India, and in particular with, with the fluctuation of tariffs? I'll get back to you on the specifics, but it's, it, it is fairly widespread that there is this tariff overhang. Um, there's, uh, outside of my membership in agriculture, there are very high tariffs as well. Um, food products, other areas that we're seeing, pharmaceutical products have high tariffs coming in, other technologies have high products, uh, high tariffs going in. And it is, you know, it, it's very different. China uh, greatly reduced its tariffs when it joined the WTO in, in 2001. India has not substantially done that. It was one of the, the asks that the U.S. government sought as part of the Doha development negotiations, and it was one of the big areas where India really resisted, um, as well as on the non-tariff barrier side. I assume that the problem with some of your member industries would be that with, with the fluctuation of tariffs. I know, for example, I worked on one ag situation a while back where this was, did not have to do with India, it was with another country, but where apparently the product, from the time you shipped it to the time it arrived, the tariff could go up or down. And there was just not, the shippers didn't know what the tariff would be. Well, I, I think what you're talking about, Commissioner, is, as you well know, you know, the, the large difference between India's bound tariffs and the WTO and the supply tariffs and its ability to move that up. And we've certainly three, seen through the years with balance of payment actions and other actions where, where tariffs have, have gone up considerably. And it does create a lot of uncertainty in, in the market in terms of where you're shipping and, and, and how that's working. But we'll, we'll follow up with some more detail. All right, thank you. And this is a uh, question for Mr. Simchat. Could you perhaps just very briefly paint a picture of the insurance industry in, in India at this point in time? Um, how common is it for, for consumers to purchase insurance, et cetera? Because I know in some parts of the world, it's my understanding that in some countries, just insurance is just culturally not something which is part of society. Can you maybe comment on that, please? Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, the insurance market in India is one that, that's growing and, and, and sort of the awareness of insurance and, and the, the need for insurance, awareness of it is, is, is growing. Um, you have large parts of India, particularly in rural areas, where uh, there isn't much insurance. It's very underinsured. And so that's part of the big, that, that's a big policy goal of the government of India is to, um, is to reach those areas and to bring insurance to them. Uh, for more uh, financial inclusion, and that also applies to banks as well as insurance companies. Um, and I think that's an area where having more U.S. insurers in India could, to, could do a great deal of good. Um, to reach areas that are not insured is highly capital intensive. 
you're going to need a lot of capital to, to, to build up the networks there. Um, and so having more FDI from the U.S. would, would help um, would, would help with that, uh, that policy goal uh, a great deal, I think. Um, it's, it's really an interesting market because until uh, you know, the beginning of this century, uh, it was entirely government controlled and owned. And then it liberalized to a certain extent, we're open for more obviously, but it liberalized to a certain extent. So for instance, in, in property casualty insurance, um, uh, non-health and non-life, you've got a situation where uh, uh, four players who are all government owned uh, uh, really dominate a lot of the market. But then you also have these private insurers who've sprung up uh, since the turn of the century, and uh, there, there are 15 of them, the property casualty uh, insurers, non-life, non-health, and only two of them are entirely Indian owned. So in a way, it's, it, it's very limited in how international it is because of that FDI cap. But on the other hand, 13 of those insurers are 26% owned by foreign companies. So it's, it's a market in flux, I guess. I'm, I'm, uh, I've taken a long time to answer your question, but it's a market in flux and, uh, and is growing with the know-how and the business practices of those 13 uh, insurance companies that, are, that are, have joint ventures with international companies. So just to clarify, the biggest players at this point in time are still government owned? That's right. Yes. Okay. Okay, well, I have about 15 seconds left. Go ahead, Ms. Trapp. And just to add, I just think quickly, India, please. since you wanted an overview, we've had insurance in India for almost 100 years. So it's a way of life, and India wants more insurance, more and more people to you know, go in for insurance because it's a form of saving, and Indians are, like to save. We have a mindset that we want to save. So I think it's a very good uh, Way. And yes, the that, that of course is life insurance, which is absolutely yeah, right that's for right. life insurance. But even for property damage insurance or health insurance, I think the market is just growing exponentially. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, that concludes my questions. And once again, I would like to thank the witnesses for appearing here today. Thank you, Commissioner Robin. Thank you. Um, it was a dramatic drop in foreign investment uh, in India, thirty-five billion. In in 2011 was the, the um, level of foreign direct investment in India. It fell to $22 billion in 2013, uh, last year. How do we understand this? Are, is there anything that we can say about that drop? Can it be tied to particular policies more than others? Is, did it hit particular sectors more than others? Again, I keep going back to the Vodafone retroactive tax case. It sent off major alarm bells about, oh my goodness, what's going to happen if we invest? I think incremental investment at that point began looking elsewhere. Uh, I think also the after effects or the catch up from the global economic recession. I think companies were very cautious about where do we deploy given that the whole world is on a tentative growth path. Uh, I think we're now poised to go back into India as an emerging market in a very big way. Uh, if, I may if, I, if I may add a couple of factors that led to this, it was high domestic inflation and the fluctuation or the way the rupee was sort of depreciating. I think those were the two other factors that added to I think from our perspective, a, a lot of it, the Vodafone was a piece of it, but the deteriorating environment on localization practices, yeah. intellectual property practices, a lack of trust is what India's is government was going to do in terms of treating foreign investors, um, ha plays a role in that. You know, there's, there's an oft-quoted, um, you know, statement, money is a coward. It goes where it feels most safe. It goes where it's attracted. It goes where it's confident. And India is not that place. Uh, I, I beg to make just one statement that when we look at these localization and other factors, which have been suggested to be a principal reason for this thing, we must remember that uh, U.S. contribution to the FDI in India is only 6%. It's not that much more than just 6%. Although these policies affect more than just U.S. Uh, producers, right? There, are, it, it's, it's discriminatory Indian versus non-India. And just to support Ms. Dempsey's point, I, I think the big issues that we've seen in the last three years were, were really the issue of tax and, and the arbitrariness of tax assessments. There's been some huge tax cases that have grabbed the headlines. 
the issue of preferential market access, the forced localization issue. It started with solar panels, but it then bled into electronic goods. And then the issue of intellectual property slippage. Those have been the big three issues. And as I'm trying to suggest, the, the government of India has now heard loud and clear that these are concerns and they've been adjusting to try to re-up interest in the marketplace. And, and the worry is now that we're heading into the elections, is it too little too late? Thank you. To what extent were uh, the recent policies on forced localization a uh, reaction to China and import competition coming from China? Um, and how do you contrast sort of India's ability to develop manufacturing jobs versus China's pretty strong success in the area of developing manufacturing jobs? I think, I think PMA and forced localization was all about China, and, and we got caught in the crossfire. Um, in the end, I'm pleased that the private sector got carved out of that, and, and therefore the government did hear us, and they adjusted, and, and, and as, so far as I know, our senior leadership on our board, including companies like IBM, are pleased that it now only applies to public procurement. But China really is the, 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 the challenge for India. They are trying to manufacture they need to create 1.5 million jobs every month in India. They need to graduate people from the rural sector into the manufacturing sector. And it's not happening. And therefore, this policy was intended to spur manufacturing. And again, you just can't do that by, by mandate. And we made that very clear. So I, I agree with Mr. Summers that it's the twofold effect. One is, and as Mr. Subramanian had said in his uh, testimony, that the real elephant in the room is China. And the concerns from China, I think, are very serious for India because when you see the spyware man, where the apprehension of that, I think, is quite serious for India. And then coupled with that is the need to create more jobs in India for our youth. I just want to point out, once again, that fact, 54% of the 1.24 billion population under the age of 25. That, that means you've got to create a lot of jobs every month. Question on banking restrictions. I had a question on banking restrictions. Um, what are the FDI restrictions on market access for banks? I understood that about 50 branches of U.S. banks uh, were recently approved in India, uh, but most of them are, are one bank. Um, are, are other banks, um, other than Citibank, getting, getting access in India? If I could say, our, our members in the Financial Services Executive Committee of the U.S. IBC, the banking group, they're very happy with what's happening in India. Um, Mr. Summers, I know you followed the multi-band retail kind of flip-flop you mentioned in your testimony. Uh, you described it as a checkerboard approach, which requires 30% local sourcing and has uh, prevented the entry of major players. Um, how does that stand out? What's, what's current on those restrictions? The, uh, the opposition party that is running feverishly to win the elections are basically saying they would be against multi-brand retail. I believe it's all about the domestic political debate underway. Um, the way the government managed to pass the retail policy was to allow the states to opt in or opt out in accepting the welcoming of organized retail in their various states. A number of states did so, about 12 or 13, but when you think of whether some states are contiguous to others, you gotta build infrastructure that connects to each other. You can't just do it as a checkerboard approach. And then the 30% local sourcing requirement remains. Uh, given even that backdrop, one multi-brand international company, Tesco of the UK, has agreed to come in, however, details as to how they plan to enter or accommodate the 30% sourcing requirement is mystifying to all of us. The real challenge is going to be how do you open up multi-brand retail? It, it's the most important reform opening that we should be all supporting. Uh, India is one of the largest producers of fruit and vegetables and milk in the world, number one in the world in milk, but 40% of India's harvest rots before it reaches market. And that's due to the 
breakdown in the farm to market supply chain that's only going to get improved by a massive investment in the infrastructure of the farm to market supply chain that's only going to come with fresh investment of the organized players hence it's imperative that no matter which government comes that organized retail be welcomed and not be checkerboarded but allowed to come in full-fledged it's a it's a very much needed investment i think we at we at CII support the FDI and multi-brand retail completely the way Ron is suggesting. We need the back-end infrastructure, and this would be a good way to get the back-end infrastructure. I think we've seen that once uh, the large, uh, fast-moving consumer goods or the large companies like Coca-Cola and Pepsi come in, it's not only the front-end product that we see, but the entire logistics chain that we see and the employment that it generates, it's just phenomenal. So I think that's certainly the need of the hour. I mean, it just seems a very stark contrast of a country that's facing uh, nutrition problems and then having so much food go to waste. There's got to be a domestic constituency for, for getting more. I mean, this, the second market. green revolution will be the opening of the multi brand retail sector. Right. Okay. In the policy that has evolved, government has tried to balance different political forces. Okay, just this is not really the subject of our study, but to uh, take a risk here, can you all give us a little bit of perspective of the major trade barriers that India complains about in the U.S.? Where are we hurting uh, Indian exporters to the U.S. with U.S. policies, or where do they believe that we're hurting them? The, the one that I hear a lot of noise about, two, two areas. Uh, the immigration reform that's taking place up on Capitol Hill and the enabling of the movement of our technical professionals back and forth between both countries. It, it really goes to, I think, uh, Commissioner Keith's question, and that is the, it isn't just the old days of outsourcing to India. It is now a 24-7 innovation cycle where all of our American companies once they go to bed at night, the innovation is getting taken up in India, places like Bangalore, Pune, Hyderabad, etc. And then that innovation is able to go around the clock and enable our companies to remain globally competitive. That requires movement of people. So they're very much worried about an immigration bill that does not contain discriminatory provisions. And in fact, Senate Bill 744 does. Uh, and so they're, they're watching that debate very closely up on Capitol Hill, recognizing the need that America has for, for reforming immigration. Second point is, I hear a lot of concerns by India about the totalization or the lack thereof. Uh, a lot of their people that come here and work temporarily pay into our social security system. <clears throat> it's now amassing to a, a, a big chunk of money in the, in the multi-billions. And, and because India's social security system is not exactly reciprocal to our own, there cannot be some treaty mechanism whereby we, we give that money back, and, and therefore that is, a, that is one of the very discussions we've been hearing about. Uh, also, many of the Indian global players are coming into uh, resource-heavy uh, industries. So one-third of the Marcellus Shale is owned by an Indian company up and down uh, the east coast of the United States. Uh, companies from India are buying into our coal mines, in a way to secure future energy equity as a matter of energy security. And they're having challenges with the EPA as I think all of our coal companies are here in the United States. So those are some of the samplings, but I'll be happy to provide additional testimony in my written submission. I have to Canadians think of the immigration issue as a trade issue, but in our context, it's really not connected. Do you see a linkage there? Do they see it as a trade issue? I, I think the, the informed leadership, the thought leaders in the country worry that if it is perceived by the Indian polity that a, that a policy gets initiated out of our United States Congress that would hit hard the jewel in the crown industry that India so much prides itself on, the, the global IT industry, the worry for many of our companies would be, my goodness, does that cause India then to react and buy an Airbus versus a Boeing? And so uh, no one's articulated it as a trade issue, but the, the worry is that could the policy uh, understand it as such and therefore react accordingly? 
Uh, it's awfully easy to bash, bash multinationals uh, in any global environment, and therefore, but that's the caution about how we need to proceed with, uh, with an understanding that we're dealing with a population that is massive, that generally likes the United States, but let's be cautious about what signals we're sending, for example, from up on Capitol Hill. Uh, in India, the common man wouldn't distinguish the difference between the administration, the Congress, et cetera. They, they, would, they would perceive it as America is doing this. And I, I think one more thing, if I may just add to that. I think India views the India-US relationship as a more strategic relationship, not just purely trade. While the focus seems to be on trade, India would like a more holistic approach to the India-US relationship because we do believe it's a very strategic and an important relationship. And I've been hearing really a lot um, to back that up, Pauli, is that for India, I think the United States relationship, strategic and commercial, is the most important relationship by far than with any other country. So, so it is vitally important for India to engage with the United States. If you still have time or no. <laughs> I was just going to say one other area where we do hear criticism of U.S. policies, although it's quite misguided, is claims about Buy America and, and procurement restrictions in the United States. The United States, of course, was a founder of the government procurement agreement in the World Trade Organization. India is an observer and has not even started negotiations. If it would like a reciprocal trade relationship on government procurement with the United States, we would certainly hope it would um, endeavor to actually start those negotiations and move forward. But to turn around and talk about the U.S. procurement market um, as restrictive and not even being engaged in those, those negotiations um, always greatly, greatly upsets me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Key. Uh, uh, no further questions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I just said a couple things post hearing. Um, Summers, could you provide staff with a list of Indian states that are you consider most open to foreign investment and the list you consider least open? Just do that post hearing. I'd be happy to do Good. that. Thank you. Um, Ms. Dempsey, I think you made a reference to, I think it was 12 intellectual grocery licensing. Cases. Not 12, but there, there's, a, there's a number that were, were both okay. denied in the culture license. Yeah. Okay, and I think because yesterday we only heard about three and only one, so I was just wondering, post hearing, make sure everybody's that. talking about the same thing. Um, I think those are all the questions that I have now. Did anyone else have questions? Does staff have any questions for this panel? two questions. Uh, the first three witnesses, I think, all talked about the defense and aerospace industries. So has India taken any particular steps to ensure adequate trade secret protection to support the defense, aerospace, and other sensitive high-tech industries in the collaborations that you mentioned are occurring? And is there anything else that's needed in this regard? Thank you. The most difficult part of the negotiation in the sale of what has now become $12 billion worth of defense and aerospace equipment into India has been the issue of uh, our requirement in the United States to have end use verification. That was very uh, uh, nimbly negotiated and carefully negotiated so that everybody is comfortable that what we're selling India is being used for what we're selling it for and that it's not going into anyone else's hands. So. Authorities on both sides are very pleased with that outcome. I also want to add that India is one of six countries ever to have gone into lunar orbit, and on the space capsule for the ISRO, the India Space Research Organization was a Raytheon uh, capsule support. So it's amazing at some level of strategy how we are cooperating on the highest end of technologies. Our second question for the panel is in, in our request letter, we've been asked to look at both technology transfer and local content requirements. And these are used in many different ways. In your opinions, do you think they're the same issue? And if they're actually different issues, is there a specific policy or policy that sort of sharply delineates the two? I, I will follow up with my written uh, responses on that one. That would be great, thank you. 
I'll go one other question to post here. No one's mentioned competition policy. You know, and sometimes when you have developing countries, they do things that if they had a good competition policy, it would have been better. So if that's relevant to our consideration of uh, post you might cite it. Mr. Simpson? You might be thinking of a different aspect of competition policies, but as you know, in U.S. trade negotiations now, state-owned enterprises and uh, disciplines on state-owned enterprises are part of competition chapters. Uh, so it might be an aspect that uh, in the insurance sector that the commission could look at. A lot of them say that India has just evolved a competition policy through the Competition uh, Commission of India. Uh, we have been very engaged with India in its formation, its formulation, and frankly, it's been very helpful in the sense that it's been uh, the cartelization issues domestically, which have been now really the subject of the scanner of India's own competition policy, which have been helpful to, uh, to our companies. Good. Uh, if I finally add to that, we've had a uh, broad paper on India's competition approach and how it should be, which then was translated into the law. We have the Competition Commission, which has been functioning now for five years and very effectively. But last year, uh, we had a draft competition policy on models somewhere, something similar to what policy the Australia has. Because we realized that if you have a national competition policy, then that might even add to the growth levels in India because the experience of Australia and one or two other countries has been quite phenomenal when they see how competitiveness increases with uh, the existence of a comp national competition policy. So we do have a policy, it's in public domain, and it is now being debated. Um, I would just add to the chairman's uh, request that when you look at the competition policy issue for purposes of the post tariff submission, uh, take a look at what's actually happening with competition policy and not just what the policy says, if you would. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with no further questions, I think it's time for a lunch break. I want to thank this panel.